This is a story that goes back thousands of years. A story of the land of the Great Nile, which wasn't a land ruled by the desert as it's today. Rather, it was a green garden covered with water and rivers. And on this land, one of the greatest mysteries of history will later be built. Kofo, Kafra, and Menkora. These are names of pharaonic kings that were given to giant buildings that people believe to be nothing more than mere royal tombs, known as the pyramids. But scientist Christopher Dunn had another opinion and evidence that they're giant machines that connect with each other to the edges of Earth and beyond. At an unknown time, the pyramids were built in a geometric shape closer to imagination. We can't build like them today despite having great technology. The story of building the pyramids is a dilemma of the mysteries of dark history. Were the pyramids really built to be tombs of kings? Most archaeologists today agree that the pyramids were built for the ancient Egyptians as tombs for kings. Let's think with a free mind. Is it reasonable to build an edifice with such accuracy, size and exorbitant cost to be a cemetery and nothing more? Evidence has recently appeared confirming the naivety and invalidity of this theory completely. Archaeologist Mark Lenner says in the Complete Pyramids book that it's absurd to think that the pyramids are tombs. Their interior design and narrow quarters aren't commensurate with being a royal cemetery. Also in the pyramids of Giza and Dahshur, no funeral ceremonies were found inside them. And the mummies date back to the 4th dynasty. They're not the mummies of the era of King Sinefru, who is believed to be the king that ordered the construction of the pyramid. And the other evidence is that if those rooms inside the pyramid are tombs, why don't they bear any inscriptions of the king's name? And why are they devoid of any decorations? If we look at the Valley of the Kings, which is the most famous cemetery in Egypt, we find a quarter full of majestic inscriptions and decorations in honor of the body of Ramses VI. Arriving at the body room, we find funerary inscriptions and the royal name indicated next to the tomb, which undoubtedly confirms that this is a cemetery. But the rooms inside the three pyramids at Giza and the two great pyramids in Dahshur, as well as in Maidum, are completely devoid of any inscription, drawing or memory praising the king. Rather, the shocking fact is that most of the more than 120 Egyptian pyramids are devoid of funerary inscriptions. There are those who try to give answers only in order to bridge this dilemma by saying that at that time writing hadn't developed among the ancient Egyptians. It's a completely wrong interpretation, because there are antiquities found from the 4th, 3rd and even 2nd dynasties that show well-developed and very clear writing inscriptions, which confirms that the rooms inside the pyramids weren't engraved in any drawing, not because writing wasn't developed, but because there was no need for that. Mark Lenner confirms that he hasn't found in all of the discovered pyramids of Egypt any of the mummies belonging to their owners. In Minkaura Pyramid, a mummy belonging to the 26th dynasty was found. That is, 2000 years after death of King Minkaura, and his mummy wasn't found at all. And the same matter applies in both Kofo and Kafra and the rest of the 120 pyramids. So the mummies found in them aren't original. Here researchers say that the original mummies were all stolen in full, which is a very reasonable possibility but there's evidence confirming the invalidity of this as well. In 1954, in Saqqara region, the Egyptian archaeologist Zakaria Gunaim excavated the tomb of King Sechemchet, and after two years of excavation, he found a closed entrance with three walls, so he broke them all until he reached the sarcophagus, which was closed and its edges were intact and untouched. 
Here, researchers were sure that the mummy inside was original and that no one had stolen it. But when the sarcophagus was opened, it was found to be empty. Zakaria thought at the time that the mummy had been stolen, but he soon described that idea as stupid. Why did the robber put the walls of the sarcophagus back and then build three thick walls in front of the tomb? At the same time, excavation studies confirmed that the tomb was untouched. Then he thought saying that the king decided to be buried in another place and left the tomb empty. But he asked himself why did they stick the coffin as if it contained valuables inside it. Here Zachariah learned that the chambers of the pyramids have mysterious uses, the discovery of which may lead to a profound change in facts of history. Looking at the king's room in Kofu pyramid, we find that it contains a sarcophagus made of red granite, but without a cover that's estimated at several tons. What idiot would cross all these obstacles to reach the pyramid in order to steal a cover? However, the sarcophagus was originally placed in this way for a specific purpose. In Minkaura pyramid, we find that it has only one entrance with equal dimensions, 120 centimeters. Is it conceivable that the ancient Egyptians would build a huge cemetery 65 meters high and then make a narrow entrance for it that could hardly accommodate a single person bent over? These things confirm that these rooms weren't tombs but they were used as tombs hundreds of years after their construction. So what's the use of them that made hundreds of thousands of workers build one of the greatest monuments of history ever? It's not wise to transport 30 million tons of stones for hundreds of kilometers and then build mighty edifices just for the sake of a cemetery. If we take a look at giant dams that are used to retain water and prevent floods, they're also used today to generate electricity through turbines. But thousands of years from now, turbines will be gone and only stones will remain. We can only see stones of the pyramids, but what's hidden in them is a really great matter. Despite all this, the prevailing theory that the pyramids are tombs has become an irrefutable fact in educational curricula and archaeological references. Any attempt to criticize that theory will immediately be faced with a barrage of ridicule and denial. The strange thing is that the most famous Arab and Western archaeologists officially acknowledged that they aren't just tombs. But what was revealed in the 70s will make skeptics swallow their tongues forever. In 1976, the American journalist and researcher Peter Tompkins wrote a profound book called Secrets of the Great Pyramid. He mentioned for the first time studies and discoveries from the first era of archaeology, where he showed the accuracy of the pyramid design and displayed its three inner rooms. The lower, the middle, and the upper room, which is known as the King's Chamber. Scientist Christopher Dunn reviewed this book and asked the question that would arise from any astute researcher. Why build three rooms if burial will be in one room? At first, he thought that the upper room was the king's, the middle was the queen's, and the lower was the eldest son's. But this hypothesis was soon discovered to be completely wrong as each king has his own tomb. Then a new hypothesis emerged that the lower room was built to be the king's funeral chamber. But he didn't like it, so the middle room was built, which he also refused until the third upper one was built. But Christopher found this to be completely unconvincing. If the king didn't like the lower and middle room, then why was construction of the quarters leading to each one of them completed? Why were they also open to each other? Then he completed the study of the upper room, which is supposed to be the king's, to find larger questions in it. Where he found that there are five stone chambers that were placed horizontally. He wondered what are their usefulness and what's their relationship to the room. We live in a time when we're accustomed to interpreting things in a way that silences any free thought. When Christopher raised the question as to why the five chambers were above the royal chamber, it was said at the time that they were to lighten the load on the chamber. 
But if that was the case, why weren't these loads placed in the queen's chamber even though the burden of stones on it was much greater? Or why weren't they put in the lower room on which the pyramid was built? The engineering answer says that the collapse of the internal structure due to pressure will lead to erosion of the pyramid and its complete collapse. Then Chris found that these chambers weren't placed in any other pyramid. The engineer studied the matter and answered saying, If these chambers were really in order to lighten the burden on the royal chamber, then why wasn't something like them put in the chamber of the red pyramid, above which 90 meters of stones were built? And here Chris began to be more sure that there's a great secret behind these rooms and that they're not rooms for human or funereal use at all. Rather, they form with the pyramid a giant stone machine that had an ancient and solid use in the lost civilization. Christopher studied the pyramid's quarters and chambers over a period of 20 years using a complex technique, which is reverse engineering, that is, studying the pyramid from the inside out. In his long study, he reached results that many may see as some kind of fantasy. The pyramids have two main functions. The first is to generate energy and the second to provide static electricity to regenerate cells, just as Nikola Tesla secretly did a century ago. But this hypothesis need to be proven and this is what actually happened within 30 years. In 1995, an audio engineer named Tom Dunley came and conducted a dangerous experiment inside the Great Pyramid with approval of Egyptian government at the time. He placed acoustic impulse transmitters and sound measuring devices in the King's Room and the five upper chambers above it, in addition to the large hall and quarters. He reached a conclusion that shocked the scientific community at the time after something unexpected happened. When sound frequency reached 30 Hz, the King's Room vibrated as if a sudden earthquake had occurred in it, and sounds reverberated to the measuring screen to show that the King's Room was standing free only on the lower stand without being connected to the body of the pyramid, as if the room was built independently. A bigger question was posed here, why was this room built with such superior engineering? Experts at the American Institutes for Research met to study Tom's experiment. Christopher and the team concluded that building the room in this way was made specifically for vibration, which is what happened when sound reached the natural frequency of the room. Natural frequency is the state in which the body vibrates when stimulation, either acoustic or kinetic, occurs to it. For example, if you bring any object and give it a sound stimulation equal to its natural frequency, it will vibrate automatically in what's scientifically known as resonance. This is what happened in Tacoma Bridge Collapse when wind transmitted a sound equal to the natural frequency of the bridge and then the bridge started shaking on its own and collapsed. Everything that exists has a natural frequency at which resonance occurs. That is, sound energy has the ability to destroy just like sound bombs. Hence, Chris found that the upper room of the pyramid was built and adjusted freely and separately from the body of the pyramid in order to vibrate. As for the purpose of the five chambers polished from the bottom and zigzag from the top which were built above the upper room, it's in order to reach resonance and then vibration. Here we face two more questions. Why did the pyramid builders want vibration to occur? And what thing did they use to make that happen? The answer to the second question will automatically answer the first one. Dunn was sure that the biggest secret was in the lower room that was responsible for generating vibration of the upper royal chamber. But he was missing evidence until one of the engineers interested in his theory came forward and presented him with evidence on a golden platter. More than two decades ago, engineer John Cadman studied the lower room and the quarter leading to it which is located at the bottom of the Giza Plateau with a length of 100 meters that slides down. He noticed that its walls are flat, smooth and of equal dimensions. It reaches directly to the lower room from which two quarters branch. 
He found that this model is an exact copy of a ram pump, which is used to transfer water from a lower area to a higher one, depending on air and water pressure. When water descends through a long tube sloping downward towards the pump room, a pressure force is generated that pushes the first valve to raise water to the top. And then the second valve opens to allow water to descend and rush again without electricity or fuel, just relying on natural physical laws. But during this process he found a strange discovery, which is sound pulses similar to heartbeats as a result of pressure and discharge. That same model, back in June of 1999, This sound was the scientific evidence for Christopher's theory as the lower room in the pyramid was working as a large ramp pump in order to generate high sound pulses. Water was transported to the lower room through the wall that connects the three pyramids. And water enters the long corridor that connects to the lower room and is emptied through pressure which produces a pulsating sound as a result of water hitting the room ceiling through filling and emptying naturally, generating sound pulses that caused vibration inside the pyramid all the way to the king's upper chamber. What confirms this is that the lower room has erosion and natural sculpting caused by water, and we find that the room ceiling is level in a controlled manner in order to generate sound at a certain frequency. What proves the validity of this theory is the quarter that was built straight downward to form the compressor for the pump. As for the third proof, it's the composite stones that surrounded the pyramid from the outside. These stones have great strength to surround vibration inside and without them the pyramid will falter and collapse as a result of vibrations and interactions. And here we found how vibration was generated for the upper room, but the most important question remains, what's its benefit? The answer will be in the middle and upper room. There are two narrow passages leading to the queen's chamber, a northern passage and a southern one. And when Christopher began to search, he found traces of a strange substance on the northern passage walls. And by analyzing it, he discovered that it was a hydrogenated zinc. In the queen's room, he found traces of zinc chloride salt. By examining the southern passage, he discovered traces of hydrogen chloride acid. By studying these compounds, it's been scientifically confirmed that their sole purpose is to generate hydrogen. The reactants were poured in from the two northern and southern narrow passages. It's been historically proven that these two openings to correspond to positions of stars. The General Research Authority demanded more physical evidence, so a small robot was designed in order to discover these narrow passages that were 20 centimeters in length and height. And at the end of each of them, a small door was found that was certainly not for human use. There were two copper handles on that stone door and it was slightly higher than the passage surface, meaning that it allowed liquids and air to pass. It was found that the copper handle in the northern opening was corroded due to traces of chloride acid, while the other handle was dark in color, which is caused by zinc in electrolytic reaction. That is, those copper rods in the northern and southern passages were two poles, and as for the queen's room, it was the reaction room. For production of hydrogen and its transmission through the passage to the large hall and then to the upper room, that is, the royal room, which contained 1500 tons of granite, in which quartz crystals reached 60%. Chris found two strange things, the first is production of hydrogen, and the second is granite stone. And here he discovered a secret that was the definitive proof of the validity of his theory. Granite stones are stones that can generate electricity if they're subjected to pressure, and you can try this manually using a piezo disc, which is a granite stone that generates energy by pressure. But the idea in the pyramid was based on two things, firstly pressure and secondly sound. The pulses issued in the lower room were amplified through the large hall. The large hall works exactly like how the vacuum vessel in musical instruments does. 
in order to amplify sound and make it stronger to generate vibration in the upper room and also to stimulate quartz crystals for energy release and high chargers. Here it becomes clear to us that the pyramid with all its passages was built for the royal chamber, which is the heart of the pyramid in which energy is generated. What's the benefit of vibration? To explain the usefulness of vibration, Chris used Maser, an invention that preceded laser, discovered in the 50s by physicist Charles Downs. It's a device that collects energy from hydrogen atoms and releases it in one wave. In order for the Maser to work, we need a metal-free chamber equipped with a hydrogen inlet, an energy guider, and an outlet for the energy to exit. Quartz or diamond, which is stimulated by electricity, must be placed between the energy guider and the outlet. The amazing thing that Chris discovered is that the king's chamber is literally a giant maser, as it was equipped with a chamber for hydrogen access from the middle chamber and a wave guiding entrance with an exit to it, punctuated by a huge granite sarcophagus which is quartz crystals that produce energy. But here we're missing power supply to stimulate hydrogen and quartz atoms. That was done by pulsations of sound and vibration and energy was generated just like how piezo disc works to bring out the wireless electric current from the pyramid. What confirms this research more is that the sarcophagus was molten in its front part due to great heat, while the room has completely turned red as a result of interactions. But another confusing thing was found, the room moved 7.5 centimeters and the upper ceiling was cracked. Engineers found that the room was subjected to great internal explosion as a result of pressure. And this explosion caused the pyramid to stop working and the sarcophagus was displaced. After the pyramids stopped working for hundreds of years, they were used as burials. After Christopher published his theory, critics wondered why the Egyptians didn't mention this in inscriptions or even papyri. The obvious fact is that so far there's no papyrus that explains the method of building the pyramids, let alone their work mechanism. But there are inscriptions that undoubtedly show the use of this energy resulting from the pyramid, which we'll reveal shortly. There's a question that has raised a lot of controversy. What's the benefit of energy that was emitted from the pyramids and how was it transmitted wirelessly through the pyramids? This question was answered by the Serbian scientist Nikola Tesla about whom we previously prepared a documentary. When, at the beginning of the 20th century, he built a large tower in America to produce free wireless electricity and succeeded in lighting bulbs wirelessly and he used static electricity to treat diseases and heal skin. This tower, designed by Tesla, was completely identical to the pyramids, as the pyramids send wireless energy to illuminate lights at night in Egypt and operate machines that are still mysterious to this day. And what confirms this is the Egyptian temple of Dendera. One of the inscriptions shows a bottle with a luminous wire and without handles, which confirms that it was powered by wireless electricity. There are other symbols similar to modern lighting tools like Jet Pillar, which was inscribed on hundreds of Egyptian temples and tombs. Another thing that confirms ancient Egypt's use of electricity is the catacombs of Serapium. How did they manage to build them underground for long distances and narrow passages in complete darkness? Some may say using torches, but they consume oxygen quickly and with hundreds of workers present, they'll extinguish and workers will suffocate immediately. What's certain is that they used wireless lights and advanced tools to accomplish this superior engineering. The pyramids were in different places around Egypt, so how were they connected to each other? An independent study found that the obelisks were made of granite and stones that transmit energy and even nourish it. They were distributed in all regions of Egypt just like wire towers that transmit electricity today. Invention of electricity happened thousands of years ago before the civilization disappeared and perished. And this is something that will inevitably happen to us as well.
In 1936, near Baghdad, railway workers found a tomb covered with slabs of stone. They also found pottery vessels, one of which had a copper cylinder exactly in the middle and an iron bar in the middle of it with severe rust on top. The material was scientifically found to be a battery dating back nearly 4,000 years. There were also found inscriptions of a helicopter, submarine and tank in Abydos temple engraved with high precision on the ancient Egyptian temple walls. The pyramid design is commensurate with the ancient Egyptians' dream of immortality. They built a coherent edifice in order to remain forever and they've always sought to reach the golden man, that is, the immortal. It's been mentioned in some sources that people in the past used to live for hundreds of years. And the question here is, what made people's life decrease from hundreds to dozens? A person is a person, it hasn't changed, but what made us grow old starting at the age of 50s? In contrast to the ancients who were in the age of youth at the age of 300 and 400. The answer lies in the living cell. There's been a change in the living cell that made its life shorter. Aging begins first in the cell, and therefore treatment of the cell will change that composition. The study that Chris reached reveals a medical aspect of the pyramid which generates static electric energy. That energy prevents decomposition of organic matter and at the same time air and natural life were a thousand times better than now. Nikola Tesla in his research concluded that static electricity delays aging and don't think that it's the same electricity at your home. That electricity causes you shock or even death if you touch it. But static electricity is energy and if a person is exposed to large quantities of it, it also leads to death. The pyramids in the past were a scientific project and a complete system to create a wide ocean of energy and to preserve the human cell and delay aging in order to reach the golden man. That is, in a more correct sense, they were factories that aimed at human immortality. But immortality is something that wasn't written for any human being on Earth. Pyramids spread in most regions of the ancient world. In Egypt, Sudan, China and some regions of ancient Asia, Latin America and even Antarctica at the edge of Earth. Evidence indicates that Egypt was the first to build pyramids and then they spread to various regions of the world and connected with each other. And they weren't in isolation as it's taught today. That is, according to this theory, they were energy towers connecting civilizations of the ancient world with each other. Nikola Tesla was aiming to build similar towers around the world and to transmit electricity wirelessly and for free. And he succeeded in that, but his project was opposed and stopped by the Grand Assembly. The problem today lies in minds of most people who are only restricted to what's being broadcasted on screens. It's difficult for them to believe that these stones contained within them giant, sophisticated machines that work to produce energy. If our civilization ended for some reason, and we bring a flash drive made of some metal, what will future generations say about it? They'll only consider it a small piece of metal, and it will be difficult for them to believe that we used it to store hundreds of thousands of data. And this is our situation today, as we only see remaining stones, but we don't know anything about the ancient super-civilization that was more than 8,000 years ago.